this is the uh, very powerful panel that we had just before we had lunch. Um, I will let the panelists introduce themselves. Marco, uh, William, please. Uh, William, uh, is, if you can tell us uh, what you do at your firm, a little bit about your firm, um, and then we'll do the same process uh, with other panelists. Okay, just Thank a brief you. introduction. Yeah, sure. Um, so the international assets management. Um, so major uh, majority doing private equity uh, investment in China, and uh, we are set up in Hong Kong with uh, different structure makes. Uh, of course, Citic is the major shareholder, um, and we have Itochi and uh, Ifma Bank from Middle East. So we have offshore, onshore funds investing in uh, in China. Um, I'm also the uh, Citic Carbon Assets Management Group, uh, which you know, servicing the CDM market in Europe and uh, the nowadays serving China as a common credit trading uh, development and also other uh, servicing advisory, financial advisory, also uh, private banking, uh, investment, <coughs> serving clients in uh, uh, out of China and also in China as well. S Cynthia? Cynthia, will you be speaking in English or in uh, Mandarin or Cantonese? <laughs> working for the interest uh, global and uh, um, uh, we are one of the largest fund of hedge fund based in New York with a uh, uh, total in uh, about uh, 20 billion US dollar and uh, uh, we set up our first office in Beijing in 2013 and uh, started from uh, the Greenfield and uh, 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 luckily you know we worked together with one of the largest commercial banks uh, in China and uh, launched the first bank-sponsored fund of a hedge fund uh, in China in 2014. So um, as you know, the hedge fund industry uh, has a pretty, you know, comparing to the US, uh, has a pretty short history in China, and uh, but uh, we managed to select about like 40 to 50 managers from a very limited uh, pool, and uh, um, thus you know accumulated a lot of experience about uh, the difficulties and the challenges and uh, of selecting the managers in a local market, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, in more detail later on. So. This is uh, what I'm doing. Thank you, Cynthia. Hi, I'm Steven, Steven from uh, Franklin Templeton and Multi Asset Solution. Uh, we globally manage about 130 billion of asset for multi asset that is across both uh, liquid and illiquid asset classes uh, for both uh, institutional clients and retail clients. And uh, I'm based in Hong Kong covering the client in North Asia. Marco. Yeah, good day ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Marco Liu and I'm a consulting manager from China versus China's wealth and investment team. So uh, we majorly provide uh, investment service for institutional clients, including pensions, banks, uh, sovereigns, and uh, insurance companies. So uh, by investment service, we major three things. Uh, one is our research and tools, uh, including our macro and as a classes research on uh, our capital market function and out as well as our global uh, manager database. And also we provide an uh, investment uh, consulting services ranging from uh, asset allocation, uh, portfolio construction, manager selection, and portfolio monitoring. And last thing is the uh, database solution, uh, which uh, we call an offshore uh, outsourced CIO. So uh, our global as under, uh, under advisory is uh, roughly 13, tri 13 trillion US dollar, and uh, our global as under management is roughly uh, 240 billion US dollar. Okay, let me do the mathematics. So it's uh, 25, 130, and 250? Yes, uh, 13 trillion for so as under. So we have a 600 billion dollars here in investable assets. Uh, yes. Okay, and uh, Ying, are you are they your clients? That's good money, right? Definitely. <laughs> so the uh, so Ying White from uh, Clifford Chance, 
uh, in China. Great Chance is an international law firm that's headquartered in London, and uh, we are, I'm actually in charge of the investment funds and investment management practice here based in China. So what we do is basically we assist Chinese managers who want to go offshore and then set up offshore hedge funds and private equity funds or fund formation owners. And then on the other side, basically international managers, fund managers, asset managers, uh, hedge fund managers, private equity managers, they want to come into China, access the Chinese market, either by investing into the Chinese stock market from QV and RQV, Stock Connect, or they want to set up RMB funds, you know, through PFM, or QDLP, QFLP, that's what we do, we do their China fund formation as well. Great. So how about we start with, uh, with you, Ying, uh, tell us, uh, the difference between uh, hedge funds in the US and then offshore, let's call them offshore funds, and then onshore uh, funds here in, in China. So if I am, um, if I want to be an investor and uh, I want to invest in onshore fund, is it possible if I'm another Chinese national to invest in actually an onshore fund? Yeah, very, uh, very good, very interesting. So there are two, basically two parts of your question. So if you are a foreign investor, you want to invest, you have your own offshore money, you want to invest into a Chinese funds. In any other context, it's very easy. But here in China, because of currency control, actually there is, it's very difficult. Unless you have a quota, unless you have a license, unless you have a program, you know, you, you know, either through Q fee or Q fee, or you have some other kind of quota, you actually cannot. You have to be able to convert your money from US dollars into RMB to invest in Chinese funds. So that's why you only have to go through certain access programs. That's what we call them, access programs to invest actually into the Chinese funds. Any, yeah. any, any new regulations that we should be aware of that you think oh, might come? Yeah. Lots and lots of opening. Market opening, relaxation of the regulations, you know, as part of the, you know, the trade, trade talks. So they are just so many uh, measures are just market is opening up, it's liberalizing. So the basically what's going to do is to create more access programs, the more quota and the more licenses, so that make it the, uh, the entry easier. So that's for you have offshore money you want to invest into China. But then if you actually want to set up your funds, now you're offshore, now you want to come onshore, set up a fund, basically by AUM in China setting up onshore Chinese funds, managing Chinese investment money here in China onshore. So that's what we call, the, you know, in China PFM, private fund management, private fund manager. So that's what you have heard on the news, right, about some, the, 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 about 19 right, big global managers that have set up the management entity here. So that also, that's, high, that's quite regulated, involving a lot of resources and all that. This is another area that's also opening up, you know, basically quite previously in the private fund space, you can be wholly, you can set up your own wholly owned subsidiary and managing funds here, setting up funds, managing funds here. And then going forward, starting next year, that's what's the news, the CSRC has released the news that say, uh, that's starting next year, I think you can do wholly owned, basically sponsoring and managing mutual funds. There has been progression in the right direction, so there are more. Uh, the, the market is opening up, in other words. Okay, Marco, uh, can you tell us the difference between uh, um, due diligence, manager due diligence on hedge funds specifically, uh, um, between uh, U.S. or European Western uh, world and the Chinese world? How do you, when you look at onshore managers here in China, mainland China? Uh, how they different, the infrastructure, the investment process, portfolio construction, risk management? Yeah, uh, good question. So uh, I think the bottom line is uh, domestic managers are becoming more and more mature and uh, institutionalized, uh, which means um, uh, consultants like, Block, like us are able to uh, evaluate uh, domestic managers uh, from so-called global perspective. So uh, that's the bottom line. So, but uh, when we uh, eva evaluate uh, domestic managers per se, uh, we have to understand that China market is a very unique one, very uh, different one, uh, because a lot of panelists has, uh, have been discussing today that there are a lot of uh, uh, inefficiencies in China market, uh, which means active management 
can make sense, can uh, achieve our performance from long-term perspective, perspective in China. But when we evaluate uh, domestic managers, one thing we have to be really careful uh, on is how they achieve the our performance. So uh, we act like managers with the uh, with the consistent uh, investment strategies, investment process, but uh, and also a stable portfolio construction process. But in China, we found uh, some managers they tend to. Uh, have very high turnover ratio and uh, they, they, they like to use some market timing and uh, uh, market timing as well as some style shift in order to uh, uh, opportunistically catch the market uh, uh, catch the, 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 the market opportunity. So one thing we have to be really about, uh, careful on is is their investment approach really sustainable, uh, especially from long term perspective. Great. Well, I think the same question applies to uh, to, to, to you, Stephen. Um, you guys are doing very similar stuff, so obviously, um, what's the philosophy of a Chinese uh, a mainland uh, manager? How is that philosophy different from the Western uh, manager? Yeah, that's an interesting one because we are actually an open architecture where we can invest into our own front end sample chain kind of strategy support for the um, China strategy or we can actually go down and do similar to what consultants do like other third party funds. The interesting observation that we have is it's just so hard for us uh, to find the right managers in China that we like that can serve the purpose for our Western client. Uh, maybe contrary to what one might think, actually it's easier to convince an Asian client, a uh, Hong Kong client or a Taiwan client, to employ some of the onshore uh, China multi-asset engineer than convincing a Western client. Because a lot of the clients in the US, in the, in, the, in, the, in the Euro, they have so many fiduciary duty and they have so many internal protocol or procedurals that the trustees may be looking after when they try to appoint a uh, asset managers, whether it's in UK, US, or in China. So when they try to apply that framework into what we have seen onshore, there's so many struggle. There could be a manager that we like, but then when we see how the manager is being structured, he might be running as more what we call the star manager approach, where there's lack of check and balance on how the investment call is being made. There may be substantial key man risk where there's no cause or protection. If the manager left, how are we going to ensure there's continuity on the investment strategy? There could be like system mismatch where in China they could heavily rely on say even the, the wind system which does not talk to the Bloomberg or other system which can create a lot of the operational challenges that we have. So there's so many little greedy things that uh, one I think is easier if you want to get exposure from the onshore China. But actually, when you really want to do it, there's just so many obstacles ahead that makes you eventually might think, and your client might propose say, hey, whether you can just go access through a Hong Kong manager, or whether you can just go access on a benchmark exposure, do it passively. Uh, so that's kind of the journey that way we have, uh, especially talking to some of the client that is based outside of Asia, maybe in the Western world. Thanks. Cynthia, uh, I don't know if you feel more comfortable in, in Chinese. I have this uh, translator, so whatever yeah, you feel more comfortable. Yeah, I saw you doing a translator, yeah, so I'm going to do it in Chinese. I'm going to take this uh, to New York City with me. Um, so my question is, your um, you do portfolio construction, right? So you manage the diligence, and then based on what analysts tell you, then you, you construct portfolios. So tell us a little bit more about how you construct portfolios. Um, I, 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 I,
呃选择这个啊、呃、管理人方面带来了很多新的挑战。那么我从我过去几年的这个经历上面来说，我觉得有两个可能是比较重要的一个啊、呃、因素哈。啊、呃，一个因素呢，就是在这个选择这个管理人的这个过程当中。啊、呃，很多时候我们今天上午刚刚才也听到很多关于这个 alternative data， 啊、呃，那这个大家在说 alternative data 的时候，更多的是从这个 investment 的层面来讲这个 alternative data 的作用。那么，其实，在选择管理人方面，也有一个 alternative data。说出来可能大家都觉得好笑，但是在我个人的经历上来说，我觉得很重要，就是市场上的八卦。呃，因为很多东西你们能够得到的，别人也能得到。从这个里面，你能够得出来的一些信息，有可能是一些表象的信息，但是反而是在一些不经意的谈吐当中，一些八卦里面，你可能能够嗅出一些别人可能忽视到的潜在的风险啊。呃，另外一个呢，可能就是一个 active management。就是在海外的，像我们做放做 f o f 的，一般来讲，像换这个 manager 是一个蛮大的事情，我们不会频繁的换，大概的频率是一年 review 一次，换一次。那在中国这个市场上，政策的变化可能导致这个啊某一个策略的生命周期就会很短。大家经历过二零一五年的股灾，可能就会知道熔断。啊，限仓使得很多 quant 的 strategy 在很长的一段时间，它基本是失效的，无法执行的。无论你这个 quant 的这个 underlying manager 是多么的好，他们的策略在过去证明是多么的有效，在那个情况下它是无效的。所以在这种时候，你为了让你的资金有最大的效益，你可能就要去转变到其他的 strategy 上面去。那么我举几个我自己亲身经历过的一些例子，让大家告诉大家，就是这个啊 ，gossip has value， 啊，就是在其实也是在我们自己在选择基金经理的时候，有一个基金团队，一个经管理人，他既往的 performance， 这个 manager 的 credential 都非常的亮眼，他自己现有的产品的回报、回测都很好。但是呢，不经意的情况下，我们听到了一个消息，这是个夫妻店。其实刚才在前一场的这个 panel 里面，有人已经提到过这个问题了。那夫妻店可能带来的问题，就是在遇到决策冲突的时候，谁来做主？在家里面的时候，可能太太强势一点，太太做主。那在做公司的情况下，谁来做主？这可能是我们需要考虑的东西。还有一个我们需要考虑的东西。一旦这个现在这个社会变化也很快，家庭的不稳定因素也很多。一旦他们夫妻两个有矛盾，啊、呃，甚至他们的婚姻都面临挑战的时候，这个公司还能不能继续的稳定的存续下去？那当时这是就是，如果你只看产品层面、策略层面，我们认为这是个值得投的。但是你要考虑其他的因素。我们又觉得这个里面有很多的风险，那最后综合考虑，我说还是再放一放吧，因为这种情况呢，在中国啊还是蛮常见的。因为我刚才说了，中国是一个 emerging market， 东西都很新啊、呃，而且很多 manager 呢都是有一个相对来说比较短的一个 history， 所以你要想从这个 historical data 里面来 track 一些东西，可能是不够的。所以在这个时候，这些啊。呃我们所说的道听途说的东西，也许有一些有一些 value。那么从这个例例子里面，我们当时只是说，我们先 put on hold for six months， 我们看一看大概会是什么样。啊、呃，最后发现六个月没到，市场上就有传言，他们两个要离婚，而且闹得不可开交。呃，我们当时就在讲，哦。那看来这个里面还是对的啊，这只是我举的一个例子。我们在这个过程当中碰到过不止这么一个例子啊。我不是说所有的夫妻老婆恋都不好，呃，但是这个里面可能有一些东西
我们在做 operation due diligence 的时候，需要有一些考量。那在这种结构下面，我们可能更多的会关注它的团队的结构是不是合理，它的这个产品对某一个人的依赖性是不是那么的强。呃，那如果你能够综合考虑下来，还能有一个满意的评分，也不是不能投的啊。这是我要说的第一个。那第二个问题就是关于 active management。那么很多时候，其实啊、呃，在外人看来做啊 f o r t h 是一个相对容易的，因为最有压力的这个投资决策啊、呃，不是在你这个层面，而是在你雇的这个 manager 的层面。那我们投完了以后，我们要做一些什么事儿？其实要做的工作还是很多的，因为你投完了，其实钱给了他，你的压力是真正的来了。你要不断的要跟踪，要看他们的，不光要看 performance，performance performance 只是一个方面，另外一个方面，你可能在中国这个市场上，我觉得最大的风险是一个 compliance 的风险，因为中国的政策非常的啊、呃，有很大的不确定性。那在这个不确定性当中，可能有一些 manager 他们在做的一些 strategy， 随着政策的变化，原来没有什么太大问题，可能后期就会有一些问题，或者是因为政策的变化，使得他的策略会有一个阶段性的失效。那在这种情况下，你能不能及时的调仓？能不能及时的去和 manager 去沟通，来做一定程度上的调整？这都是我们需要做的。表面上来看，做起来还挺简单的，但是其实真正要做下去，我还是相信一句话：力不到，不为财。这些都是一些辛苦活，要细致的去做，而且能在这个做的过程当中有一个前瞻性，做一些调整，是至关重要的。啊、呃，我先分享到这儿。谢谢，谢谢。I don't know if it's good pronunciation. I'm trying my best.、Um, William, tell us、uh, from your perspective. I know that、uh, your company is a little bit different than、uh, Franklin Templeton and、uh, Mercer, as well as、uh, Cynthia's company. So,、uh, tell us about、uh, how you guys do、uh, this management diligence or on 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 hedge funds or private equity managers.、Um, I think,、uh, from my personal experience,、um, I actually worked for um, um, AB Namro for for about like、um, seven to eight years before I, I came to Citic. So, coming to Citic is a is a big change for me. Coming from、uh, MNC international market, moving to China in the last more than twelve years. So the changes,、uh, actually, I learned from the changes. So to realize the difference between. International market and、uh, the PLC market, and I see the changes from the last two decades、uh, in mainland China, from a high wage generations to now locally、uh, room of market for new investment managers. I still remember we call the days about like ten to ten to fifteen、uh, years ago when you talk to the、uh, Chinese banker investment managers.、Um, they are very presentable、uh, because. And we have a very common protocol、uh, for those days because they are all coming from being、um, educated and grown in the U.S.、Um, or from the international market.、Uh, but nowadays, when you talk to the、uh, local managers and bankers,、um, they have a very local perspective.、Um, they understand the current market right now is very much、uh, political driven,、um, and they very understand about the.、Uh, The、uh, investors' preference and how the market changed from day to day.、Um, so you, you see the you see the changes here. And when you look at the、uh, investment manager, how to pick the right candidate for doing different jobs. You have to look at because it's very complicated. It's mature. As other uh, uh,、um, um, fellow panel、uh, members also mentioned that you know trying to have a couple、uh, characteristics we all agree and recognize.、Uh, number one, the history. It's rather uh, uh, only a decade or at most two decades、uh, for the capital market, the second market, and the、uh, people culture, the investor culture is very different. And、uh, 
and also is a is a political driven economy. These may, three major factors which will interactively affect how the investment manager in global and how we pick the right right candidate. So we can't you know meet the candidate uh, uh, try to work with them to cooperate with them to 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 be set up a joint venture set up a fund uh, whatsoever even the hybrid equity market not so sophisticated as a secondary market with a lot of different problems. Uh, you still uh, have to learn how we really, really got the success in the past on certain deals or funds management as they mentioned whether they are sustainable and how to apply to the new world because it's not just China the whole new world is changing so fast um, even in the US market because of the uh, also affected by the political um, sentiment as, as, as well we, we don't know what happens tomorrow right even I'm coming from Hong Kong so every day changes because of all those political issues and, and, and things around us so you never know how the capital market reacts on all those uh, incidents so fast. So you, all the elements you have to calculate all together, it's not just the uh, investment managers that we are uh, looking at, the whole, the whole environment and also what the business we are doing uh, so that you can make the right decision and make, make your own judgment for that, That's how, how I was. Thank, thank you, William. Um, let's go back to the um, uh, yin and discuss more legal issues. So, um, how does onshore seeding works? Um, if somebody wants to seed uh, several managers and construct a fund of hedge funds portfolio and has lots of money coming from, let's say, US, but would like to uh, take care of, you know, in other words, would like to take advantage of alpha that can be generally much easier here than in the developed world. What's the process of, and if it's possible to become actually a seeder uh, in, in mainland China? It's a very uh, good question. Again, you have to think of everything because China is currency controlled, so you got to divide. Because my, my whole talk always divide up between the onshore and offshore. So if a Chinese manager have offshore hedge, you know, hedge fund, so basically based in Hong Kong, based in Nevada, so then actually that's normal. You see whatever the normal, you know, two ways, either through a revenue sharing agreement or you participate in equity, take a, you know, a shareholding percentage. So that's all normal and, and easy. No difference from what you would have done in the US. But you want to see a Chinese manager that's actually only have RMB funds, onshore in China, then actually becomes very difficult. Because now that involves money coming, they, you know, how do you tap into that revenue that's only in RMB, that's only onshore. Remember, because China has this currency control. So actually, the revenue sharing agreement doesn't work. So you're, you're only left with the option of participating in equity. Basically, take a percentage to do a joint venture, participating in the uh, equity of the Chinese manager. So for a lot of institutions, we have found out for a lot of institutional managers, institutional uh, uh, investors, they don't necessarily want to always participate in doing set out, almost like setting up a joint venture or you know, do an acquisition of a percentage of a Chinese manager. That's a major undertaking. You are coming onshore as a foreign investor investing into China versus I'm just having a contractual arrangement of revenue sharing. The problem with revenue sharing is just by a revenue sharing agreement, actually there's not a legal basis for the money from the Chinese manager's earnings to go out to be converted into US dollars to go out of China. That's why revenue sharing agreement doesn't work. See all the unique challenges when you work with the channel. Wow, so it's fascinating. Uh, one needs to be a uh, brain surgeon <laughs> to structure these deals. It's very, very fascinating. Um, going back from manager due diligence, uh, let's discuss operational diligence because obviously uh, operational due diligence is equally important or sometimes is even more important, right? Because when uh, something goes wrong with a fund, uh, it really comes from operational due diligence mostly, unless uh, there is a black swan event um, and the fund loses money, has didn't diversify enough, and the correlations were almost uh, equal or, or, or positive. So, um, Marco, if you can discuss a little bit about operational due diligence, do you guys look at operational investment due diligence as holistically as one? 
or you have specialists within your firm? And the same question will apply to uh, Stephen as well. Okay, thank you, Vidak, for giving me the chance to introduce uh, our business. So actually, we have a global dedicated uh, operational due diligence group. We call it uh, Mercer Sentinel because we sort of believe, uh, believe that the skill set needed for carry out operational due diligence is quite different from uh, investment due diligence. Um, you need background including uh, compliance, including trading, uh, including risk management. So uh, that is why uh, it's, it's kind of unique and uh, it's quite different from what we usually uh, know as uh, due diligence. So um, I think uh, the, 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 the importance of uh, operational due diligence is sometimes uh, underestimated in China uh, who tend to um, put more emphasis on the performance or on the investment strategies. But sometimes uh, you need to realize that there is a part uh, from the manager that they can explore uh, market inefficiencies and they can create our performance, uh, which we call uh, investment strategy, uh, idea generation. But on the other hand, there are some parts uh, in the manager that can uh, probably that can uh, erode uh, the alpha that you generated from investment process. So. Um, we, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, we manage uh, roughly uh, 270 billion uh, across globally uh, for, for dedicated solutions. And for each and uh, every single strategies that we make investment, we will have to carry out uh, due diligence for uh, uh, operational due diligence on those strategies on the managers. And one of the philosophies that uh, in our versus Sentinel is that um, we, we understand their uh, market best practice, but sometimes uh, over uh, too much emphasis on operation can be a substantial cost uh, for the manager. So we we we, we don't rate uh, our managers by by operation. We uh, rather give them uh, some light uh, uh, color indication, such as green, uh, amber, and red. And uh, the, 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 the core philosophy here is that we, 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 we tend to uh, give those managers uh, some, we, uh, I mean, our, the philosophy here is that we will tend to uh, apply better market practice or general market practice for the, those managers instead of market best practice. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so it's kind of similar, similar question to you, sir. Yeah, I, I guess on, on that end, I, I agree with my fellow, fellow panelists that there shouldn't be too much of a divergence in terms of how to do a manager research or a due diligence process because all the good process or good matrix that you want to find in a global manager should apply the same in the, in the China onshore manager. Where views diverge will be on the place where how much trade-off you want to make, how to tip the balance between uh, customization for the China onshore market versus following the global sort of like the framework or best practice one app. So for for instance, I mean, you know, when you try to present your case or your portfolio being constructed to a client, then you try to highlight what are the, the risks. Uh, to be honest, I think investing in the managers underperformance or losing money is relatively easy to expect. You know, client understand there could be managers losing money sometimes. But I think the challenge part is how to help the client understand what is happening in the portfolio, whether the manager is still maintaining the same style, keeping in line with the tracking era. I think these are the things that we see a lot of challenge in China because say, when you talk to a onshore manager who can be a very good manager, outperforming manager, there's little concern about tracking error because that's the environment that he's operating. He, most of them are actually operating in a more like a hedge fund absolute return kind of environment where they see you know return as the only thing that they care about, not so much about the risk, not even about the benchmark level, no tracking error. So how much are you going to tip the balance between that if your global framework when you are constructing a portfolio for a client? that follows that top-down framework, how are you going to take the balance? And that's where eventually a lot of dialogue eventually goes down to the investment belief part where the client might say, 
okay, I understand that. I understand if that's the cost and if that's what it takes in order for me to explore the alpha in the local market, hey, do I still want to take it? Because ultimately, that's the risk budget that we need to figure out. And maybe now more than often when we see clients might actually say, maybe that's not the alpha that I want for my portfolio. Maybe that's the area where I'm happy with the beater. I'm happy with going down passive or out exposure. Or maybe I prefer the active risk bucket to be spent on the illiquid market, on the private market, where you spend that 2.5 or 3% on supposedly on the onshore listed equity part, secondary part, and help me to find instead a private equity manager or an EC manager. And you try to you know juggle around the portfolio so that you can still you know capture the overall parameters of the portfolio. So there are some changes around how clients or asset managers think about to capture the sort of like alpha for the local manager part. So that's some of the observation that we've seen. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so Cynthia, I think there are like twelve thousand uh, managers. They call it private funds. They don't call it hedge funds, right? Because uh, hedge funds, uh, you know, you are allowed to short, and you cannot really short eight shares. You could, but it's kind of difficult. Um, so, in terms of from your experience that you see all these managers onshore, um, can you provide us with maybe some anecdotes or uh, in examples where you uh, where your team was able to uncover some frauds? Um, in the uh, utilizing operational due diligence. In other words, uh, I would assume that uh, it's, uh, you know, compared to the Western world, um, where you have a SEC and uh, the markets are more developed, that the fraud, I think, might be more prevalent uh, here in, in, in the Chinese onshore market. Is that correct? Uh, let me answer to from, the, from the different, a slightly different angle, okay? Um, I think the operational diligence is a uh, it's pretty challenging process uh, in the uh, in in uh, in China, and uh, one of the reason is uh, I think it's still uh, because of a uh, short history and uh, also uh, the uh, at the beginning you know people as a uh, uh, other fellow uh, panelist has mentioned you know people more focus on the performance rather than the. Uh, middle and uh, back desk risk. Okay, so um, at the same time, and I think the investor also attribute uh, the, to some degree uh, to this kind of situation because uh, um, a lot of doesn't matter whether it's an uh, institutional investor or retail investor, they are you know chasing uh, the yield and. Uh, as long as you can give me the number, and uh, everything is uh, is okay. Uh, but uh, in the Western world, uh, it's uh, uh, slightly different because we know uh, the performance give you uh, either you know more or less return. However, if you encounter uh, operational or compliance, uh, you know issues, and this is a, a death and a life uh, question. So we pull, put a lot of emphasis on the uh, operational due diligence. However, I, I think uh, people has to be uh, more realistic and uh, give a little bit of patience of, uh, to this market because this is a still a growing and an emerging market. And uh, I, I, I can share uh, my own experience, you know, back in New York, we do have a questionnaire we call the operational due diligence. That is a 70 to 80 pages long questionnaire. And each firm has to fill it out. And I looked it through all the pages and find it out. There are probably like two thirds of the questions. And I don't think most of, you know, uh, most of the managers, local managers can answer it. And uh, so if you, uh, you know, just copy that uh, operational due diligence uh, questionnaire and uh, trust to try to use that as uh, some kind of, you know, exam examination test to screen the managers, it will be very, very difficult for you to select 
uh, manager uh, in a local market. Uh, however, I think it, the situation has been changed a lot, and there are more and more, uh, you know, uh, Chinese uh, U.S. trained uh, uh, investment manager come back to China, and uh, in those firms, uh, they do take the op operation due diligence uh, issues uh, more seriously. So those people has. Uh, uh, really put uh, uh, very healthy seeds in the local market and uh, then because of uh, you know those changes so I think uh, uh, more and more local managers has realized the importance and I think also because uh, you know the overall market environment and uh, the regulatory environment has changed over the time as well and uh, uh, the regulatory agents has put uh, uh, more and more emphasis on the compliance issues and uh, also operational issues. So that has, uh, in other hand, you know, forced the local managers to uh, really take a step back and uh, build up their middle and the uh, back office and the back desk uh, accordingly to uh, the, I have to say, quote unquote, Western uh, and uh, more mature uh, standards, and uh, this is a, a, I think is a big development um, of the local market. And uh, in terms of a fraud, and I think a fraud happens everywhere, and uh, even in the U.S., the well-developed market, there are also some fraud happens. And uh, but because of uh, uh, the uh, you know a, a good. Uh, uh, infrastructure and uh, legal and accounting framework, and uh, uh, it, it might be uh, easier compared to the uh, China market to spot some kind of default. And there is a very, uh, you know, uh, standardized procedure to uh, penalize the people who try to fraud the system. But uh, in China, you know, I think, uh, like I just said, you know, you need to work uh, uh, harder, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know messages and uh, risk signals uh, embedded in some kind of informal uh, conversation. Like I said, you know, some gossip definitely can tell you a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, something uh, behind the scene. So you just need to uh, you know, leverage all kind of resources you have and uh, try to uh, you know, smell the things in advance and uh, uh, take the action accordingly. Thanks, Lydia. Great. William, similar question. Um, how do you guys, uh, uh, what's the process that you have in place to cover potential uh, uh, discrepancies in, operational, in operations of, of managers? I think I, I, I would like to follow up with uh, also Cynthia uh, thought as well. Uh, because of the history of the, the market here, it's, it's not easy to find, you know, what the ideal candidate to be in the role or the place. So what we can do is, at the end of the day, it's results-oriented, right? Um, this is not necessarily, we just put more effort to work out the uh, due diligence, finding the right guy, be sure uh, he should be the one. Right. Uh, to fill the pots or the doing the wrong things. Um, you will have to think about the pots engagement things that work a lot, like the media back office things or a mix of team that can work well together. Um, because Mozart, for example, uh, I would like to uh, also echo the uh, what Sina say about the like the provide due diligence for both of the people. Uh, uh, not not just the uh, investment manager, the boss, probably the business partner or the, the, the firm that you're investing in, you're doing due diligence, it happens with the same thing. Um, they were just, okay, um, very nice uh, question, a very comprehensive one, but they come back to you with uh, just uh, a meeting to resolve all those questions instead of a lot of a punch of a data room with a lot of documents that we used to see um, I think it happens all the time because of the cultural difference, because of the uh, uh, mentality difference. I mean, uh, people like to talk, to resolve, to understand what you mean, what 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 your stuff's behind, what your questions behind, instead of uh, a kind of an open book. So, uh, provide what do I have? I provide 
whatever, and I think we are facing the same. So instead of trying to push or ask for what you want to do, uh, and, and you, you understand the situations, and you try to fix it afterwards. So put in the right control system, measures, uh, put in the right people. Uh, so that's what I, I also mentioned, that probably the hybrid team will work better than just focus on the, on the investment managers. So you have a very comprehensive system, internal control things, probably uh, supported by uh, a foreign team uh, who, are, who have a different mentality of best practice rather than just stick on groups uh, to have a you know, rationale to justify what they have been doing or whatever. Um, so that is the way I, I, I would do to try to fix the things. Sure. Thank you. Um, let's, take, uh, let's talk more about operational due diligence and then we'll switch to investment due diligence again. Uh, so Ying, if you don't mind telling us, uh, manager selection process, somebody comes to invest in a uh, Chinese on onshore uh, fund, what are some of the things uh, that you, from a legal point of view, would basically advise a, a big allocator that comes to, uh, to, to, to China to look for managers? Yeah, it's good, because I was also going to comment on what the last two uh, panelists, the Cincy and uh, was talking about. So the, you know, the one of the things you've got to understand is the history of this uh, industry. We have to talk about this emerging, this is new. Because prior to, 20, prior to 2013, the, the whole hedge fund, actually, I'm sure, the, it was, it was illegitimate. There wasn't a law, actually, legitimizing this industry. So that was all that time, we're talking about Sunshine Trust, right? Sunshine, you know, managers and all that stuff. So because there wasn't actually, wasn't a, a law that permitting the hedge fund actually managers and hedge fund uh, funds um, to exist in China. So it's only 2013 when the Chinese Securities Investment Funds law was made, you know, had major overhaul and a major amendment introduced the private placement, the private offer funds chapter, and then actually legitimized this whole hedge fund industry. That's why this whole thing is so new. This you know this then since then there's a so-called regulator is AMAC. It's an uh, asset management association in China. So the AMAC problem is, is actually some, it's an SRO. It's like FINRA in, in the US, a little bit you know, like FINRA, but it's not, the, it's not CSRC, it's not the SEC. It's a self-regulatory organization, but the functions like a licensing body and the functions like a regulator. So the, what we have found in practice is a lot of US institutional investors, if you want to actually place money with a Chinese manager, well, they, if they don't have a Hong Kong SFC Type 9 license, then they don't, of course, they don't have US license either. So where is this, where's the licensing status of this Chinese manager? The highest status they can get is this AMAC registration, which is not really, AMAC technically is not the license, is not the regulator, it's just SRO, self-regulatory body, industry association. So that's something that, you know, the, um, the institutional investors have to get familiar with, have to dive, you know, basically dig into about what AMAC's whole regime is about, whether that's credible, that's sufficient for purposes of institutional investor, for purposes of you know, saying this manager is actually licensed. And number two, I think the, um, the, um, uh, the questionnaire, due diligence questionnaire and all that uh, part, from a legal, I think, perspective, when you look at the, uh, because onshore managers have to be registered with AMAC. So when they registered, there was a legal opinion. This legal opinion was like a verification opinion. So it goes, goes, will go through a lot of the uh, facts about this uh, manager. So that's a very good point. I think that the institutional investors now can rely on. But in my view, only the part about the invest manager's CV, you know, and then some basic fact, the educational background and all that stuff is useful. What you need to look at is whether this manager has adequate internal controls, has adequate policies in terms of you know, setting up Chinese walls, dealing with insider dealing, having AML policies. Actually, none of this is actually required by IMAG here. So these are things actually the legal opinion, whatever the registration, material doesn't cover, so you actually need to look at extra stuff to see to actually meet. Yeah, you have to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, uh, almost six minutes left. Uh, 
So w this conference was about alternative data, artificial intelligence, investment management, geopolitics, etc. So I'd like to um, address these issues uh, in equal time, maybe a, a minute and a half each. This is like Olympics here. Uh, so if you don't mind, uh, Marco starts telling us how important is alternative data in your process when you actually look at the managers, uh, AI, quant stuff, etc. And same same question applies to, to everybody else. Just give us like a, a minute of your take. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, good question. So because we have seen uh, uh, emerging market uh, competitors who use uh, AI as a as approach in a manager selection process, and for us we appreciate uh, we appreciate the, the the involvement of the industry, and we also think that the investment is a like, sort of a combina uh, combination of art and science. We can utilize the the, the, the science part in the art part, uh, which means that we can use the AI in a sort of uh, fund screening and uh, fund monitoring. But for the uh, evaluation on the fund, uh, on the strategy, is is some uh, a, a, a lot element is actually people business how we uh, how we communicate communicate with the with the portfolio managers how the communicate ma uh, portfolio managers um, think of the of the of the market so there are a lot of uh, people component in it so I think the effective combination of AI and uh, manager researchers like us can be something uh, interesting uh, some interesting combination in future. The, on the topics for alternative data, I like the one of the point that is being made in one of the previous panel where he thinks there's you know there's has always been alternative data. There's nothing new there. Uh, I'm sure there are times where people think even managing a portfolio using tracking error, sharp ratio, or expected tail loss could be alternative data that they think. Uh, obviously, nowadays we try to see alternative data as more like smart meter, AI, using factory investment. These are all different perspective and, and good perspective that we use and help us to understand managers or clients better and the portfolios better. Uh, I guess in the context of uh, China where a lot of the fellow panelists emphasize the importance of history on how the managers evolve, the background that they are managing, which I totally agree, then I will say that the best way for other investors to get better use around it is to utilize better on some of the local intelligence that our panelists mentioned about and figure out a way to consume it on a global basis. I think that's how I see the importance of alternative data. Thank you, Stephen. Cynthia? Uh, I, I think I'm pretty you know, optimistic about uh, you know, how the big data and the AI Technology can help uh, in the selection of the managers, and uh, I, you know, again, I want to use uh, my own experience and uh, example. Yeah, because of uh, uh, you know the the issues we mentioned before, and I think uh, uh, to understand uh, the managers, you know, how they make the money and uh, uh, where they lose the money, what's their style, is quite important. So transparency will play a more and more important role in terms of uh, managing the portfolio. So we have a pretty comprehensive database uh, uh, from the manager we hired and uh, we uh, want to hire. And uh, so in that database, uh, we keep the very comprehensive in terms of uh, where the company comes from and what's the relationship among the, uh, the key managers and uh, what is their strategy and how they make the money. They make money from the, uh, you know, their uh, uh, allocation or they make the money mostly from the active trading or whether they, they, their uh, you know, actual behavior is consistent with uh, what they presented to us at the beginning and uh, whether there's a uh, style shifting, all those kind of things. So uh, those data definitely helped us to, uh, you know, smell uh, some kind of unusual things uh, in advance and also tells us where the problem is and how we can, do, we can fix it. 
So I think a database, uh, uh, the big data definitely is going to play a very key component in terms of uh, perfecting uh, the market practice and so how also the, to help the healthy growth of the overall Chinese market in the future. Thank you, thank you. And William, please. Okay, um, I'd just like to uh, share two facts, which uh, is they are self-speaking, self-explanatory. Uh, Citigroup covers uh, most of the industry in, in the country, about 90% of the industry, but although we are very much strong at the financial segment, we have Citi Security, CRSA, we have uh, Citi Bank, or Citi Trust, Robot, etc. Um, and we are, we are doing a lot of uh, B2B business, but recently, as we, somebody may, may, some people may be aware of this, that uh, they acquired the uh, Adorno uh, operational rights for, 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 for China and Asia, uh, I mean, Greater China. So you can see that we are moving from uh, a B2B business model also to an M2C model. Um, that speaks for itself how important the, uh, the data, uh, the big data is. Um, in the micro world, uh, what I've been doing in uh, the city common set, uh, we have been working very uh, closely to develop an ecosystem for the uh, environmental uh, carbon reductions, uh, carbon emission reductions program for the general public. Uh, and you, you can speak for itself uh, how important the day-to-day -day transactions, like transportation, behavior, why, how they interact each other, and, and why we're doing this. Of course, because we are city, we're doing something for, this, for, for, for the country, but also it has its economic values inside it. Great, thank you very much. Uh, please, round of applause. Uh, excellent time.